morning. All right. Hey, good morning. Good morning. You guys can grab a seat. And uh, a couple things. We're going we're gonna to take some time this morning, and it's fourth Sunday. Those of you who have been around for a while at Mosaic know on fourth Sundays we take time and we break bread together and we celebrate communion and we remember all that Christ did for us by going to the cross. And it's um, especially important as we approach Lent, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit at the end of the service, and a little challenge for us as a faith community to kind of travel through the 40 days prior to um, Easter to just really remember all this means. But this is just a really important time. Um, so we're excited about that. And as we talk through that and approach the communion table today, I'm going to take some time to talk about um, trust and, and God's protection, all right, and what that looks like and uh, what Scripture kind of says about that and, and does God actually even really protect us. And it's interesting um, thinking about man camp, okay, Protection would probably be a good word that you guys would, would pray for us over man camp. Um, I know like on Wednesday nights, on contender nights, Kayla just prays that my heart keeps beating uh, when we play basketball after contenders. And uh, I thought Jeffrey was going to have a heart attack this past Wednesday. It was pretty incredible. He was laying on the floor flopping around for a few minutes. I didn't know if he was playing or for real. Um, but here's the thing. We, we often pray like the Haiti team. A lot of times we, we want to pray for protection and safety. Uh, but I don't know that there's a lot of scripture that really promises us safety. What scripture tells us is that God will be with us. And that's something really, di- that's ultimate protection. Um, that's, like, that's like the best covering you can have. But the, the problem is we often just like seek worldly safety and comfort, and we put a lot of our trust in the worldly things um, when there's a much bigger thing that, that we talk about, a bigger, grander idea when we're talking about protection and what that means. And it's really um, living in the will of God, that God would use us. And so something I've learned in my, my trips to Haiti and even just this last time that we went and praying with our team and praying with my son before we got on the plane is not, uh, God, keep us safe. You know, like he wants to do that anyways. It's not his will that we would be hurt Uh, But the bigger thing is, God, use us. Show up, teach us something, grow us, stretch us. And that may mean that it doesn't feel like a safe trip to us. But I think in those moments are the times that we really ultimately feel the presence of God. So um, today I'm going to talk to you um, about an Old Testament scripture, and this is kind of fun because it's from a book that maybe, I'm going to say this, you guys are like, that's not a book, you tricker, I can't find that anywhere. Um, It's from an Old Testament book called Nahum, all right, and you're like, "Uh, where's that, all right? Uh, That's between Micah, which maybe you know, and Habakkuk, which you also are like, what would you just say, a funny word? Okay, no, that's, these are books of the Bible. Um, in Nahum chapter 1, you don't need to turn there. We're going to have it up on the screen. It, it'll take you all service to find it, and you'll get frustrated. It's towards the latter part of the Old Testament. Um, so here is Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. And I'm going to put this up here, and let me tell you a few things before I read through this and talk through this. Um, this is, so, so what we're going to do today is, uh, this message I, I gave about a month ago to a couple chapels, um, one here at Veritas and one at LCS. And as I was preparing for it, I just thought, man, this is like a perfect communion chapel. Um, it really, really hits home. And I had a few people just say, you've got to share that on a Sunday morning. So, so that's where we're going to go with this. Um, but there's, there's some things we've got to understand because this one piece of Scripture in Old Testament is just loaded with content. There is so much to understand here. So, so who's Nahum before we go over there? Nahum is one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Okay? Uh, he was a minor prophet, uh, much like Jonah was. And he, in his book, in Nahum, he's prophesying to, um, to Nineveh, just like Jonah was. But this is about 100 years after Jonah had prophesied to Nineveh. So he's saying the same message. If you read this book, it's only three chapters long. It's a great book. You could read it this afternoon and say, hey, I read an Old Testament book I didn't even know existed. But he's, he's, warning, he's warning Nineveh about the same things that Jonah was because Nineveh had fallen back into their evil, evil ways. Um, and so 
very selfish, um, persecuting people, just very far from God, not listening to his word, not being in tune with who uh, God really was in their lives. And so this is a warning that goes out. And in the beginning, though, we find Nahum uh, just talking about the goodness of God and reminding the people of the truths of God. And I think oftentimes we need to be reminded of that as well. So look at what this says. It says, The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust him. All right, so let me talk about this for a minute. First of all, the good. Um, this is like a good that surpasses understanding. All right, so last night we uh, took our family out. We, we ate at Fiesta Ranchera. And, like, their chips and salsa, it's really good. And then when you order a chicken wet burrito minus onions and pico, if you guys ever want to get me lunch, it's, like, really, really good also. All right? But, like, but we can't comprehend on a human level when Scripture talks about God being good. We put it in like a burrito box, like a good burrito box, okay? It's hard for us to fathom the goodness that scripture talks about when it talks about God. This is a goodness that, that we can't even understand. It transcends our knowledge. It transcends what our emotions and our logic and our intellect can, can feel and understand. And so this, this is a, a grand goodness. This is a massive goodness that God is. God is always good. He is 100% good. We have nothing else in this world that we understand that is 100% good. Everything has something that's manipulated or not good or fallen because of sin or people or it's just there's always something. We just don't understand this 100% goodness. This is God, okay? So, so he's reminding um, these folks in Nineveh, God is good. He is so good. He's so above your understanding. And then he talks about this idea of being a refuge in times of trouble. Now trouble, let me, let me unpack this here. Remember like the original language has so much more meaning and depth. And so when we hear trouble here in the Hebrew, it's this idea of the smallest troubles of being insecure about something or unsure of something to like we, we lost one of the most important people in our lives. And we're suffering, and we're empty, and we're broken. So troubles is difficulty, pain, suffering. It's, it's this whole gamut that he's talking about here. In these times of trouble, God is our refuge. Okay, And refuge is a word that we don't use a lot here. But let me, let me give you just a definition. It's like a condition of being safe or sheltered, kind of from danger or trouble. But it's this idea of it's a place that you go that's trusted. Okay, When you seek refuge in something, you're going to a place that you trust that you will be safe. Now, again, don't think of safety of just out of harm's way. Think about safety as like wholeness, completeness. And so when Scripture's saying that we go to God and He is our refuge, He is a place that we can trust, that will hold up, that will withstand, that will shelter us in the midst of our troubles. Okay? And then the last part talks about how He cares for those who trust Him. Okay, and so cares for, this is a, this is a really uh, cool word. This is the, the Hebrew word. Throw that next slide up there, will you? Um, okay, and it kind of looks like Yoda, if you think about it, right? Okay, but it's not Yoda, it's Yada. Okay, let me hear you say Yada. Yada, okay? So he is the God that cares. And here's the meaning of Yada. Here's what this means, to know. He cares for you because he knows you, and he knows by seeing. He is the God that sees. And we see this over and over again in the Old Testament, that God sees us. And because he sees us, he cares for us. He knows us. It, it goes on in some of the, the other words in the Hebrew that have this meaning is observe, recognize, be aware of, understand. So a God of yada is a God that cares because he knows you, because he sees you, he observes you, he recognizes you, he's aware of you, he understands you. And I think for a lot of us, we, we don't comprehend that when we think of God. 
We just think of he's like this omnipotent, like holy being far away. And sometimes we can kind of feel him if it's a nice sunny day or whatever. And, but sometimes he feels really distant, especially in our troubles. But what scripture says is that he's a God that cares. But it also says that he's a God that cares for those who trust in him. Trust, taking out of that root word of refuge. That he's the one we seek, that we go to for that shelter. We trust in him in our times of trouble. And then he sees us, he knows us, and he cares for us. Here's another piece of scripture um, out of Psalm 37, 39 through 40. And just watch how these kind of all tie together. And you see kind of those same yellow words, the same idea. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord helps. Yada. The Lord cares for. Same meaning. Them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge. Some of your scriptures in this may say because they trust in him. Refuge and trust, that you run to a place that you trust, that you know will hold up under the storms, under the difficulty, under the trials. Trust, refuge, hope in, confidence in. Okay, so we see this word here, though, stronghold in this part in Psalms, and it is the idea of where you get your strength, of what you hold on to. And again, We find in that definition from the Hebrew word that you have trust in it. When something's your stronghold, you're trusting it. And if you're grabbing on and finding your strength from it, you are trusting in it. So when they went into hard times and troubles, they held on to God. That's what scripture said. Hold on to him. Let him be your stronghold. So let me put this question up here and think about this. When we have troubles, struggles, difficulties from big to small, We all grab on to something. We all grab on to something. We all put our trust in something. When times are hard, when struggles come, when the storm hits, when it's difficult, all of us do this. What is it? We need to really ask that question. What is it? Is it our spouse? Is it a friend? Is it money? Is it working harder? Is it our kids? Is it our education? Is it a hobby? Is it an addiction? Is it something we look at on a screen? Is it, what is it? Is it intimacy? Like there's a lot of things that we start running to and we hold on to in times of struggle and difficulty. Or is it God? Because I think we oftentimes put trust in a lot of things that we shouldn't really trust, that end up crumbling, that end up hurting us, that we go, why didn't that, why didn't that relationship pull through? Why didn't my spouse, as great as he or she is, why couldn't they fill that gap when I needed them? Why, why did, I, you know, I went out and I bought this and that always makes me happier. I went back to this addiction that always filled this hole, but now I keep falling again and again because you're putting your trust, your refuge in something that's not stable. God is the only thing that covers us and protects us in all the time. So what, what is that? What are we grabbing onto? So I want to share two things with you real quick. Two times in my life, uh, one's kind of a physical story, kind of a fun story, and I won't stay there too long. With a group of teenagers, you can stay there a long time, but you guys, I'll tell a quick story. But the first time was a time when I was scared for my life. The second story I'll tell you is a time I thought my life was falling apart. Okay, so, so the first time looks like this. Let me put this picture up here real quick. All right? So... Uh, You see the guy without the helmet in the front left, and I'll tell you why he doesn't have a helmet in a second. That guy behind him with with that, like, not smile on his face, that's me, okay? And I will tell you why there's not a smile on my face. Now, the second one back on the right, that beautiful young lady was my bride-to-be that I had no idea, all right? So this is a rafting trip that we did, a whitewater rafting trip on the New River in high school. Okay, and, and here's the thing. I, I was not a huge fan of water. Like, I, I've never been a huge fan of water. Um, 
You know, I'm no Michael Phelps, and uh, I got some baggage with water, okay, uh, with, with my brother and him passing away, and just, I just don't love water. But we're going to stop, and we're going to white water raft. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'm good. We, we can do this. I can. So we get down, and we, we're signing uh, these agreements on the bus ride down to the gorge. It's like, literally, you're signing your life away. I'm like, well, okay. Hope mom is okay with this. Sign it. I'll mail it off. And then we get down there, and then see this, this gentleman might be a stretch, okay? This guy in the back with the blue, okay? So we get in the boat, and he comes up to us, and here's literally what he says. How y'all doing? My name's Otter. And I'm like, what? Otter? Really? I'm about to trust my life to a guy named Otter who takes, and he's got a, he's got a sweet mullet going, as you can see. I mean, he looks like an otter, okay? So we get in the boat, we start going down the rapids, and we're kind of like paddling. It's really nice. It's like this really cool scenic. It's a little wavy, a little bit. Oh, that's cool. And he goes, listen, um, the river's actually a little faster than normal. And uh, usually we don't hit anything bigger than a class three on this trip, a class three rapid. Um, there's going to be a couple fours today. Um, we cannot take you on a five legally. And fours are kind of like usually reserved for professionals. Fives like crazy, six, you're going to die. Like you will die. So, so I'm like, okay. And he says, so this last four that we're going to hit is probably teetering on a five. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. You just said that's an expert. I've never been in a paddle boat before, okay? So we got we to gotta talk through this. I'll, I'll, I'll lead you through it. Everything's going to be fine. So we go through our first couple rapids. It's all right. I'm a little freaked out. Not going to lie. Good thing we're in water. You can relieve yourself, and it's no big deal, right? So we come to our, our first class four, and we, we hit this thing, and it's like, it's treacherous, okay? It, it is, it's scary. And, um, and I'm kind of like, I want to get out of the boat. Can you get the bus to come pick me up? Nope, nope, you're going to stay. And, uh, but my girlfriend's sitting across from me, so I'm trying to be really manly, right? And uh, then we're coming up on the last class four slash five that we shouldn't have hit. And he said, okay, this is the big one. And it, it sounds like a train coming. Like you can hear like, this one. and I'm like, what the heck are we doing? This is ridiculous. So here's what Otter says. You have to listen so close. You have to follow everything that I say, okay? And we're going to paddle, and we need to go hard right and back left. And okay, okay, so we're paddling. It's like turning the boat around. I'm like, what are you doing, man? And we get the boat turned around. I said, listen, there's only one way to hit this rapid because it's so big. You have to hit it backwards. Well, I'm looking at the boat, and I'm going, dude, the front of the boat looks just like the back of the boat. What are you talking? There's no difference. You're an idiot. Right? No, no, no. You got it. Okay, whatever. We're going to hit it backwards. So we're going backwards, and I'm like, you know, like, oh, boy. Okay, okay. Paddle, 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 paddle. And then we're getting, we're like 10 feet away from hitting this rapids, and guess what Otter does? He jumps out of the boat. He jumps out of the boat. Right. What? Yeah, exactly. Otter. Great. Th okay, thanks, Otter. So he's like, see you later, and he jumps out of the boat. So, so I do what every strong man impressing his soon-to-be wife would be would do. And I threw the paddle down and I grabbed onto the seat, okay, like this. And I held on for dear life onto these two straps. And like I got my toes underneath like this, like, Lord Jesus, I, I may have spoken tongues for the first time, received the gift of tongues in that moment. And I'm praying and I'm freaked out. And so we go through this rapid backwards, our boat pancakes like this. The two dudes in the front get launched out. That's why Brian Mitchell doesn't have a helmet on anymore. We can't find his helmet. Luckily, he didn't lose his head. Like, there's just shrapnel everywhere we go. But we get through this rapid, and there's Otter kind of floating down. Hey, guys, how is that? And, man, okay. So if I see Otter again, um, it's going to be a bad day. Here's the point. Here's the point. I was scared for my life. I was in danger, okay? I, I was freaked, and I had to trust in something. And at that moment, these like two-inch nylon straps around that tube, that's what I trusted in. And I held on to it, and I held on with dear life, okay? And that was my refuge in that moment. I needed something to hang on to, okay? So you, you see where I'm going. Now, let me transition to a little more serious moment in our life that happened last summer, and a lot of you guys know this. And, and we walk through what we thought was going to be a nice little West Michigan trip. And we, we head to West Michigan, and it starts with an emergency appendectomy for our son, Caden. 
And then a couple days later, he's super sick, and we're at the mall in Grand Haven, and uh, he starts having blood in his urine. And so we're kind of monitoring, and he's not looking good, and we end up taking him to the ER in Grand Haven, who calls a, um, an ambulance and immediately transports him via ambulance to DeVos Children's Hospital uh, back in Grand Rapids. And we, we get there, and we find out he's in full kidney failure. Like, his numbers are off the charts. And for the first time, we learn about this thing called atypical HUS. And our, the doctor, the specialist there, calls us into this room, and she says, he has a genetic disorder, and it's very rare. It's an ultra-rare blood disease. And literally what's happening is this disease is attacking his red blood cells, and it's making them explode. And then they're piling up on his organs, and they're shutting things down. And so we hear about this new medicine that's $52,000, a bag of medicine called Solaris. And he starts getting an infusion of that. And he ends up having two blood transfusions. We watch our son lose his ability to talk and move his arm as he starts to have this um, transient ischemic stroke where he can't, he can't move, he can't talk. It's starting to shut down parts of his brain. He goes through uh, 16 shots, a pick line, okay? And I, I was beside myself. I didn't know what was going on. Like, you're leaving to go on vacation, and all of a sudden God alters the course of your life in a crazy, crazy way. And so we end up almost three weeks in, in the hospital. A lot of you guys know that, and we're traveling through that with us. And um, we come home. And some of you know the end of this story, but Caden was, we were told, Caden is going to now have to go up and have um, an IV put in his arm every two weeks and get this Solaris medicine. It's kind of like a form of, of chemo um, for the rest of his life. That's, that's he's, he's going to make it. It's going to be rough, but that's the rest of your life. Every two weeks, Grand Rapids infusion for an hour of this medicine. And so... Um, it's a few days before we're supposed to go do that infusion. And Caden comes down uh, one evening as Kayla and I are sitting on the couch, and he's, he's just scared. He doesn't want to have another shot. He doesn't want to have that happen. And he, he asks, can, can, you, can we pray? And the interesting thing was, even at his age, he wasn't praying like he was just, he just wanted to pray for strength. He wanted to pray for healing. He wanted to pray that, that he would understand that God was with him. And so we did, and as a father, like trying to lead your son through, how do you do that? Like, I know what I want. I know what he wants, but I don't know what God's hand is. I understand a little bit the goodness of God, but how, how does this work? So we pray and we pray, God, if you can heal him or take this away, in five days or five months or five years. We just want to pray that you would do something. And bigger than that, God, that you would continue to use Caden's life as a story, right? And a testament for you. And, um, and then the next day, as the story goes, you know, uh, Kayla was preeclamptic. We end up going to uh, the hospital. We're waiting for her to get prepped for delivery. We get a call from DeVos Children's Hospital saying we need to talk to you which is not a good thing that you want to hear um, when you haven't heard from them in a while. Like, it's urgent. We need to talk to you. So they're waiting to get Kayla prepped for delivery because they're thinking we're going to have to transfer you to Grand Rapids because Caden's going to have to go back in. And um, finally we get a hold of them, and they said, oh, we're sorry. We didn't mean to, like, cause all this ruckus, but um, we got some test results back that we had no idea we were going to get back. And his, his results are, are totally different. And he, he does not have a typical HUS. And you don't need to come in two days to do your infusion. And in fact, you don't ever need to do an infusion again. And it was just this unbelievable moment of God's grace and his glory and his goodness showing up. And it was a huge reminder of what we need to hold on to. And so I want to show you um, a video real quick that, that I put together for Kayla and for Caden. And um, I want you to just watch this with me, and then we'll take a minute.